Hi everyone and welcome to this fourth and final video in this series. Uh, the focus here is on what difference can I make? And it's one way in which I try to end most of the sessions that I teach, um, especially in class. And it's getting people to think about not just the learning that they're doing, but what impact can this have on the improvement of their client care? And even if you consider from a nursing, midwifery and health visiting point of view, um, consider the first part of our NMC code of conduct, which is to prioritise people. And then this fits in really well with that. So what difference can you make? Right, you might have heard of something called the Plicit model. And that was first invented by a sexologist in America in the 1980s. And what Plicit uh, stood for was the P was for permission giving. So even if it's in relation to talking to people about sexual health, maybe just mentioning the fact that yet yeah, you're fine to talk about this. Now, when you consider with healthcare practice, so often in many organisations, they might have admission forms and you as the healthcare professional, you're filling in these admission forms. And there might be a little box on there, especially from the activities of daily living. And the box just says sexuality. Well, look how many people find this difficult to fill in. Or they might write silly, meaningless innuendos in there, like, you know, lives at home with husband and three children, wears makeup or whatever. And uh, you might even get people saying, uh, you know, not applicable. Now, that could be for people with learning disabilities, physical disabilities, um, people of certain ages. There are ways in which healthcare professionals make a judgment on this. If they write not applicable, then whose words are they? The healthcare professionals or the individuals? One nurse told me once that she saw written in the box over 40. Okay, so it's going to be really important here to think of permission giving, to talk about it. The LI stands for limited information. So it could be that you start talking to a particular individual, say, for example, in relation to um, the box I've just mentioned, the sexuality box. So if you showed that form to your clients, and oh, look, here, there's a little box that says sexuality. So is there anything about your sexual health that we can help you with whilst you're staying with us or whilst, we're care whilst our service is caring for you? And they might say, well, actually, yes, I need to know more about such and such an issue. OK, so you could be providing limited information. The SS stands for making specific suggestions. So it could be that you might say, well, look, yes, I know something about your particular topic. And um, I've also got some leaflets. I can give you the leaflets on that. Um, but specific suggestion, I know of a service close by that would be really able to help you. Would you like me to refer you to that service? So you're making a specific suggestion. And the IT, now remember, Jack Anon, he was a, um, um, a sex therapist. And here he's talking about um, intensive therapy. Basically, what that means is that if, as a general practitioner, you're talking about permission giving, limited information, making specific suggestions, but then somebody needs to talk about more uh, um, expert issues that you're not the expert in, you may need to refer them on to somebody else then. OK, so that's the Plicit model. And it was used in quite a lot of sexual health services from the 90, 1980s onwards. Sadly, too many people read it in one line like this. They thought they had to give permission at the beginning, then the limited information, blah, 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 all the way to the end. So it was seen as a very linear thing to do and a very tick box exercise. But then round about 2006, um, Taylor and Davis, they put it into a totally different framework and they called it the explicit or the extended plicit model. And what they've done here is to put the permission giving at the heart of it all. So whichever stage you're at, you need permission giving, whether it's permission just to talk about sex in the first place or... Um, even permission about whether you should refer the client on to somebody with more knowledge and expertise than you. So putting permission giving at the heart of it all. 
But Taylor and Davis brought in extra dimensions, which we as um, professionals, health and social care professionals, need to be aware of. And you can see on each one of these, it talks about reflect and review. So look at the way in which we're all encouraged to be reflective practitioners, and we're encouraged to reflect during practice or reflect in practice, and reflect on practice afterwards. So maybe a client will use a term with you, or a phrase or a word that maybe you're unaware of, you dislike, you find offensive, um, you're not sure of. There are lots of things that may be said, especially around genders, identities and sexualities, that may be new or different to you. So it's important that we reflect on those things, but also to review how well our, uh, our session with the client is going. If you're with a client and they start talking to you about particular issues and all of a sudden your body language closes up, you cross your arms and your legs and you frown, maybe it looks as if you're sucking lemons, you clearly feel uncomfortable. Well, the client's going to pick up on that. So reviewing how that situation's going. So the client might think, oh, look, you're the first person I was ever going to tell about this. But if that's the response, I won't bother telling you anymore. So in that case, your therapeutic alliance with your client, the relationship, there's a real breakdown there. OK, so it's really important to reflect and review on all of this at each stage. But if you look at the outer part of the circle, that's focusing on us as the health and social care professionals. So we need to be self-aware. So if people are talking to you about different sexualities or different sexual practices, and maybe you, f you find yourself feeling really uncomfortable about this, again, check out what's your body language like, what's your facial expression like, are you conveying this through more than just verbal communication with the client. So be self-aware. And when it says reflect, that's really important there. Because supposing you do find something very, very uncomfortable, it's important to reflect in practice and on practice about why you find it uncomfortable. And remember, your client doesn't deserve for you to dump your baggage on them. So if you've got a problem with particular issues, that's for you to deal with and not your clients. OK, so I would encourage you to reflect on that, especially because there are so many issues around sex, sexualities and sexual health that can cause some people to feel uncomfortable, um, uh, especially in talking about this in a therapeutic relationship. So reflect on it, review how your, um, your interaction with the client's going, but also it may show that you need to learn more. So supposing people are talking to you about new things that you've never heard of or words you're not sure of, um, rather than just say, oh, well, that's it, I know nothing about this, and then do nothing more on it, use that as a new opportunity for doing more learning. And remember, on the learning resource that this video is embedded in, there's um, another thing that you're going to look at as well, and that's the K-A-S-H spoken of by Griffith and Burns. So it's not just your intellectual knowledge that you need to, to be working on, but your attitudes as well, and the skills. So if you think maybe you've never spoken in depth about sex issues with clients, um, therefore you might feel as if you're de-skilled or unskilled in doing this. But the more of a habit you make this, so K-A-S-H, the more of a regular habit you make this, the more you will uh, develop your knowledge, practice your skills, and challenge any negative attitudes. So really important here. And the final element of this, when it talks about challenging assumptions, that may be challenging assumptions in the client as well as in yourself. So say, for example, if a client says to you, well, look, there is something very personal I'd like to talk about, but you, you probably wouldn't like me talking about it. Well, there, they've made an assumption. So look at ways of dealing with that. And also think of ways, especially if you're asking questions, ask them in open question ways, not in closed ones. So if you said to a client, would you like me to refer you on to somebody else? There's a closed question. So it's so easy for them to say yes or more likely no. So think about your questions. And if you do automatically come out with closed questions, look at ways in which you might open these up. 
Here's just one example that I'd like to share with you on um, some do's and don'ts about using particular language. And all I've done here is take a little snip from this particular document, um, just showing you a few examples. But there are lots more, so if you check out the full document, but it's going to be really important that you check out your language because as a society, as a culture, as professions, we often use terminology which could inadvertently be blaming of others. So look at two of the terms here, putting themselves at risk and suggested alternatives might be far more empowering for individuals than this blaming of putting themselves at risk. But even when you use the word risk, especially in relation to sex, look how that's such a contested term as well. Say, for example, uh, the number of parents that may turn around and say, well, look, I told my, my teenage son not to do such and such a thing, and he went straight off and did it. So for some people, risk is a challenge. No, no risk, no fun. They want to take risk. So if you're wagging your fingers and well, don't do that, that's risky, um, they might want to go and do that. So it's really important that you, you challenge and try to understand uh, the language that we use. And the promiscuous one, I often refer to this in class as being the P word, promiscuous word, um, because again, look how genders and sexualities are really treated so differently in discriminatory ways around the word promiscuous. So, for example, if you've got um, a young uh, a teenage boy who's telling his friends how many people he's had sex with, then quite often um, many societies might think, well, that's what young boys do. You know, you've got to sow your wild oats. Um, you know, that's how you're going to grow up, learn how to become a man. Now, that's one set of attitudes. But supposing that young boy has got a twin sister and maybe she's had as many sexual partners as he had. Look at the way in which in which cultures, religions, societies, families look at a young girl having sex so differently to a young boy having sex. So even in the language that's used, and personally I would argue that promiscuity is not a sexual word, it's a moral word, and therefore it's going to change all according to your morals and my morals. So please try not to use this within sexual health contexts. Um, something else, we're, we're often uh, um, hearing the term about victims and especially in relation to uh, victims of regretted sex or victims of um, unwanted sex, non-consensual sex. So whether it's sexual um, abuse, sexual violence, rape, um, people often use the term victims. But of course, just like the word patients in healthcare, victims is a very disempowering term. So yes, people are victims of, especially crimes of other people, they are victims, but at some point in their lives, they need to work through that to survive through that. And hence, there's a reason why so many organisations call themselves survivors organisations. So they're not victims, they're not letting the power of that event dictate their lives. They're taking control of it and becoming survivors. But Emily Coulter Thompson, in this magnificent book called Queering Sexual Violence, um, she said people can move on even further and she refers to them as thrivers. So in many ways then because of past hurts, um, uh, past difficulties, relationship problems, unwanted sex, non-consensual sex, sexual violence, sexual abuse. People don't have to remain in a victim status, status for the rest of their lives. And Coulter Thompson looks at ways in which they can move, make this real big shift from being victims right through to thrivers. And one final book I'd like to mention to you, this one on transgender health. Not only is it great because there's a fantastic glossary in there of, um, of really helpful terms and terms that we all need to use as opposed to terms that we should not use. Um, really helpful, but also challenging us as health and social care professionals to think, yet yeah, that box doesn't exist, thinking right outside the box here on um, uh, transgender people, people who don't identify with a binary male or female, 
gay or straight. So thinking really outside of that uh, so that we can be welcoming services for everyone and discriminating against none. Okay, coming towards the end now and time for a recap. So first of all, I'd say it's really important uh, to know who the safeguarding leads are or safeguarding colleagues within your particular organisations. Just in case somebody discloses to you uh, particular issues, um, say for example around uh, safeguarding concerns, then at least you know a chain of command where you should go to next, what you need to do to deal with particular responsibilities or your pathways of reporting. Also, think about uh, some of the words I've used during these videos. So cash is your knowledge, your attitudes, your skills and habits. Um, and especially in relation to talking about sexual health holistically or talking about sexual health and genders as a um, secondary to people's other conditions. And then thirdly, in relation to sexual health um, as sexual infections and prevention of them, uh, teenage and unplanned conceptions and prevention of them, HIV and prevention um, and psychosexual issues. Okay, And don't just look outside the box, think as though it doesn't even exist. So when it comes to thinking about new issues like you did with the condoms, um, uh, like you did with that condoms exercise and you were thinking about if I was part of a service that wanted to provide free condoms to 16 to 24 year olds but what if someone under 16 so you're starting to think right outside that box now okay and finally have a look over the articles on the explicit model and look at ways in which you can put that into your practice if you do those four things there you really will be making a difference in people's lives thanks for listening to all of these uh, videos here's my final point remember this if there's one takeaway message sex doesn't make you sick diseases do thanks <laughs>